Welcome to Emerging Franchise Brands, the podcast that introduces you to the visionary founders of America's fastest growing franchise opportunities. We'll also hear from industry pros as they share insights on what it really takes to achieve the elusive milestone of 100 plus locations. I am your host, Frank Fumi, founder of i9 Sports, and my 20 year journey from inception to acquisition has given me a unique perspective on how to succeed in franchising. Join me as we welcome today's guest. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast. On today's show, I have the Executive Vice President of Bona Restaurants and the original Rainbow Cone Ice Cream Shop, Joe Bonavolento. Joe, how are you today? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on here. So, all right. We have a lot of history here with Bono Restaurants and the original Rainbow Cone Ice Cream Shop. So uh, why don't you share with the audience here how it got started, what, uh, three generations ago here in Illinois, right? Yeah, it's a uh, pretty humbling, uh, humbling to be a part of the company and the growth over the years. One of our strongest core values is family and uh, to be a part of a family business that uh, I believe is our 43rd year in business is uh, it's pretty exciting and rewarding. My grandfather and grandmother, they had a dream to put their, their children in business. And in 1980, uh, my grandfather took a second mortgage out on his home. And uh, I believe the amount was about $10,000. And he gave his five sons um, the $10,000 to start a, uh, a small Italian beef stand located in Berwyn, Illinois. Actually, I'm right across the street from the original location right now. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, they worked hard. You know, they were the workers. They were open till three o'clock on the weekends, um, you know, never a day off, um, really built up a great reputation. You know, our Italian beef, we feel is the best in Chicago. And uh, we had a great following that morphed into doing a catering off premise business and then opening up our second location about seven years later. Uh, seven years later after that, um, they opened their third location. And then from there, there was steady growth over the years. Wow. And did, so did the whole family work in the business full time? Oh, great question. So uh, two of them did work full time um, in the business. Uh, the other two had families at the time. So they had other jobs for insurance purposes and such. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of my other uncles was, uh, was 12 years old, actually. So he rode his bike to the restaurant after school and him and my grandfather would close the restaurant every Friday night together. So <laughs> yeah, all hands on deck. <laughs> Did everybody get along okay? Oh yeah, yeah. Everybody <laughs> got along great. It's a great. St <laughs> you, know, you know, one of the great things about my family's business is that no matter you know what the conversation is, no matter what the outcome is, when everybody leaves the room, everybody's on the same page. That's great. Uh, in fact, I just left the meeting at eleven a.m. and there was some difference of opinions, and we all had lunch right after. So, you know, um, one of the healthy things about our business is that we love each other, we respect each other, and that's how we, uh, that's how we do business together. And it has been able to sustain 43 years in business, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So what came first then? I, obviously, the Bona Restaurants is the core, or I should say, when did Original Rainbow uh, Ice Cream come into, into play? Yeah, it was actually an opportunity that uh, kind of fell into our lap. Um, in 20, call it 2016, we opened up a Italian uh, a bone of beef restaurant mm -hmm. on the south side of Chicago in the neighborhood of Beverly. And there was a uh, almost, geez, it had to be almost 90 years at the time, a uh, nice cream shop that was been in business for that long. Wow. And it was another third generation owner that actually approached our family. And, um, you know, it's an iconic brand. Mm -hmm. You know, it's five flavors stacked on a cone. Um, it's really unique, one of a kind, great following. But her dream was to grow the brand. And she wanted to partner with a family like ours that could help her do it in a tasteful way where she would um, she would remain on to help, uh, you know, with the uh, as we enter new markets and really help tell the story. So it's been a great, uh, great addition to our company. There's so much history and so much legacy here. I could only imagine uh, some of the challenges as you decide to dive into franchising because it's like having you're inviting people into your home and and being part of your family. Yeah, yeah. It, speaking of the uh, the roundtable discussions, it was a discussion for quite some time, and we found that as we grew out of our core market, 
Um, we met a lot of individuals with great operating experience that really needed a playbook and a strong brand to continue their success. Mm -hmm. And we, we know in our hearts that the long-term growth of our company is through franchising as we enter um, these different states across the nation. Sure. There's a whole new generation now of Bona restaurant operators to continue that legacy, right? Yeah. And I'll be honest, it's, uh, I'm very optimistic about, you know, what we're doing. Um, we've, we've uh, partnered with great people. They share our vision for not only what we do on a daily basis, but the long-term growth of the company, smart people, people mm -hmm. that, you know, we can learn from as well. And um, I couldn't be happier, happier with the group of franchisees that, you know, have entered our company at this time. Yeah, it's it's not very common that somebody or or a family or an entire company has has as many company owned locations as you all have had before you dove into franchising. I mean, you have 35 corporate locations right now, right? Yes, and sir. now 35 franchises open uh, all in the Midwest. We got uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana. I should say, and now Florida, I am sorry, Correct. right? I'm sorry, three, three are in the Midwest and plus Florida now, which I'm excited about since you have a location in Sarasota and Key West coming up. Key West on deck, yep, any nice, day. Nice, <laughs> nice. So uh, take me back to that decision point for, for, for you guys, for your family and for the team, because there's a lot of emerging founders that are listening to this podcast or watching and they're thinking of franchising their concept after being in business for a while. Take me to that point that where it intersected, where we said, this is, this is the strategy where we want to go next after being company, you know, corporately owned for so long. Yeah. I mean, quite frankly, COVID was the, uh, was the leading cause of our decision to franchise. We, um, we really recognized the strength of our brand during COVID, you know, other, other restaurant operators, unfortunately they had other challenges than we had. Our, our biggest challenge was human capital during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and how you go and open up new stores in a challenging labor environment when we're running, you know, this, this corporate um, structure where I'm in the office three and a half, four days a week, only in the stores two days a week. And how do you continue to make sure you have elite operations on a daily basis, right? So during the discovery in 2022, we went through all the legal process and hired some consultants, a company called iFranchise, great people, great partners for us. Um, they really gave us the confidence to go and franchise given where our uh, core competencies were. And, you know, the human capital element is what we feel franchisees in those local markets will bring to the table. Mm -hmm. So that was really, uh, you know, if you, if you uh, block out, block out some of the other conversations we had, sure. that was it where human capital meets a playbook, a strong brand, strong menu, they can go and operate at a high level in their market where if I'm in Chicago trying to develop stores in Texas, Arizona, Florida, it would be a little bit more challenging from a, from a human capital management standpoint. Yeah. And you must've had so many, all the systems and processes are in place because you guys have been doing this since, you know, since the eighties before you were around. Yes. Yes. And honestly, that was probably our, one of our biggest differentiators amongst our competition is we were ready for, for something like that to happen. Mm -hmm. We had all, all technology conducive to operating in an environment like that suggested ordering, uh, third-party delivery integrations, a sophisticated online and loyalty program. So we were kind of ready for something like that and we prospered during COVID. So that, that was the confidence we had in what we're doing on a daily basis. Now, how do we partner with operators that have skin in the game in these other markets to not only be you know, as successful as we are, but perhaps exceed that success as they develop stores in places like Dallas and in uh, Phoenix, et cetera. Yeah, Joe, I'm super impressed that not only are you guys diving into franchising after this long, but you have 38 franchises in development currently that are sold, not open yet. Um, that's got to be super exciting. Yes, yeah, super exciting, uh, super humbling. You know, um, when you do stuff as a, as, a, uh, as a corporation, you know, you're putting your own money um, at risk every day, which has responsibility. But when others are investing in your concept, there's a greater level of responsibility. And like I was telling you early on, earlier in our, in our discussion, I couldn't be happier with the relationships that we've cultivated and uh, how they're taking progress to, towards opening up the stores in their market. The way they're approaching local marketing is fantastic. The way that they're um, networking with other business owners, um, the local, you know, uh, joining the Chamber of Comber Commerce again, mm -hmm. right? Like those are exciting things that, you know, if they take our operations playbook 
and we work together, we yeah. could hit some, uh, we could hit some great results together. Yeah. Joe, this is what I love about franchising is that you bring in brilliant people that they come from their own experiences and now they're giving you feedback or input ideas that maybe you guys have thought about, you know, from time to time, but in, in many cases know that they're, they're bringing their experience to your brand and it takes your brand to a whole new level. It, it is that human capital. It's the, uh, just the mind sharing of, of all their experiences that makes a brand what it is today. Your, your grandparents would be so just, uh, j just so proud of what this thing has become. They are. And actually at every one of our discovery days, my grandfather, who's 88 years old, he still sits in during discovery day. Does um, he? He does. And he's super proud of, uh, of our family and, and what the third generation, um, is, is contributing. And, uh, yeah, it, it's wonderful. And really going back to what you said about what, when franchisees and franchisors link up, mm -hmm. it's really that level of urgency, right? You know, um, when you set your corporate budgets, you know, you, you, you press go and then you follow up periodically, but franchising is a daily, daily support system. Mm -hmm. And, uh, those, those ideas and the feedback, it's, uh, you know, it doesn't uh, doesn't go into a jar and you pull it, you know, you pull it out at the end of the year. You have to react very quickly to make those people successful. So uh, it's been wonderful. Yeah. What do you think as the executive vice president, the, the, the big difference it is now being responsible for franchise owners versus, you know, operators of the individual restaurants that you guys own? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, definitely thinking more uh, long term being at least two quarters ahead um, mm -hmm. is definitely kind of how my mind has shifted. We used to, you know, we, we could move very swiftly when it came to a new product or um, a new system software, right? But now we really need to make sure that uh, things are thoroughly tested. Um, we we're getting the right feedback from our uh, internal operate internal operators, our corporate department heads mm -hmm. um, to, to make sure that this is transferable in, in multiple markets. So that's probably the biggest thing. How big is this corporate leadership team that you guys have? Yeah, so my father is the chief uh, chief executive officer. My uncle, uh, right underneath him, is the is the COO. I'm the executive vice president, and then together we uh, we manage our corporate departments: marketing, accounting, IT, uh, HR, procurement, etc. Mm -hmm. And then we have an operations team that's heavily focused on training corporate stores, franchise stores, and then we have a whole development arm of our company where we actually, uh, we have an architect on, on, uh, on the team, as well as a construction team. And my brother actually heads up the, uh, the overall strategy for real estate and, and construction. This is a lot more than just some selling some Italian beef sandwiches, Joe. Very intricate <laughs> and a lot of fun. You know, you, if you have a boring day over here, you're, do, you, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> you're doing something wrong then probably. Right. Right. Tell me about your franchise owner. So who do you look for? Who's your ideal owner? Yeah. So, so ideally, Ideally, they have restaurant retail experience, preferably in a multi-unit capacity. Um, but, you know, even backing, backing up, we look for like-minded individuals. You really have to have a strong connection to the brand as you take this into a new market. Mm -hmm. And um, we've, uh, we, I could tell you some stories, but that's really a common denominator. They, they have the experience with the brand. They were customers of the brand when they were either living here or still live here and relocating. Um, and then like-minded, you know, the... Mm -hmm. The, the way we approach real estate, the way we think about operations, the way we want to market, right? So really making sure that people are, you know, like-minded and, and uh, optimistic, right? They, um, they're they taking a lot of faith in us and uh, not only, you know, we're putting a lot of faith in them as well, but just that relationship before you, uh, the relationship you have to create before you open up a store is super, super important. So yeah, uh, they got to fit your culture and your family, you know, what your brand stands for. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, we don't want to sell a franchise in Arizona and they're absentee. Now that's not who we are. Right. We want people that are going to work the business. Maybe not on, maybe not, uh, you know, scooping fries and, and making beefs every day, but someone that's going to make sure that the facility looks great, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that they're taking care of their people making sure that they're spending money on marketing and uh, really uh, maintaining that level of quality and service that we believe in so much over here. Mm -hmm. And so you were saying that um, multi-unit franchising uh, earlier is, is part of the expansion. I mean, those, those, that's more of your ideal franchise than somebody owning a single unit. I, I believe that there needs to be a good mix. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of um, advantages to opening up a market at three to five locations 
uh, from a personnel standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, supply chain efficiencies. But then again, there's there's certain single unit operators that you just love that you can't say no to. So we've done a mix of both. I would imagine your some of your franchise owners are coming aboard because of the legacy that they've been customers for for so long, and they love the product. And 100%. yeah, I mean the, the product obviously has sold itself for for many years, and it's 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 already sold them on wanting the concept and now bringing it to their market has got to be you know super fulfilling for them to be able to do that and feel, feeling like they could establish themselves in a market that you've never been in before yeah i mean they're in the franchising space if you look at what we're doing as a company with italian beef and the original you know uh, rainbow cone ice cream cone that's unique to chicago franchise prospects have the ability to take the first of its kind, 4,500 square feet, freestanding, double lane drive through, two iconic Chicago signature items to their market and be the first one to do so. Right. You know, um, no one's really doing what we're doing, and that's really exciting. Sure. Well, just think of all the people, like an example, that are from Chicago area that grew up, uh, you know, on your, on your brand and say moved to Florida and folks that are in Sarasota, and they can't believe that there's a Bono restaurant in Sarasota where, you know, a product that they grew up on. And that's super exciting for them. Yeah, it is. And that was part of our expansion plans to really look at where our shop and ship program is successful, why it's successful, make sure that there's a, um, you know, it's not a must, but have a, a good distribution of uh, Chicago expats and, you know, hit, hit those markets where we feel our, um, where our brand is going to be uh, recognized. Yeah. So that was part of the expansion uh, plans as well. So the 30, uh, 38 locations that are in development right now, um, uh, how many states are they spread out across? So right now, Florida, Texas, Indiana, Wisconsin, California, those are rainbow cone only deals. Okay. And um, yeah, that's it. So heavily into Texas, heavy into Florida, and then we're, st we're starting to franchise in Wisconsin and Indiana right now. And so... Uh, you guys started franchising only in 2022 <laughs> in the franchising space. You guys are just babies, but you, you set your, um, uh, you set yourself up right by working with the I franchise group. Those are great guys. And of course, and they're Chicago guys too. Yeah. Mark and Dave are, they're awesome. Oh yes. Yes. They sure are. They sure are. Um, when, since you've been franchising now for well, about two years now, Joe, what would you say maybe, uh, are some of the things you weren't expecting? Uh, that were surprises for you in franchising? Um, just the time it takes to develop locations. Um, again, we do it as a family here where we buy the real estate, we put up the buildings, and then we lease it back to our, our restaurant company. Um, just learning to be patient with site selection, making sure that you're picking sites for the right reasons, not just because it's available. Um, I'd say that that's a, a core, core thing to get your mind around is your is you're growing. You can't overcome a bad location. And then the second thing is supply chain and really staying ahead of what it's going to take to grow in a new market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me about supply chain as it relates to you know, opening all these locations in this relatively short period of time. Yeah. So, that, you know, when you hit a market, you kind of have to hit it hard because that's how you gain efficiencies. Um, and then just making sure that you have a great relationship with the vendor and you know, the food distributors so we do, you know, you know, you mentioned that not many people with 35 stores can go into, you know, after 35 locations right. are then franchising. That's actually to our benefit because yeah. of the relationships we've made. So now when we go into a new market, people know we're serious. We're in it for the long, uh, for the long term. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten some favorable uh, treatment uh, from the supply chain side. Wow. Uh, Joe, uh, what's the investment range? Uh, so the investment range for our dual branded store is three to five point two million dollars, um, and you know the the exact figures in our FTD, but that includes land, building, and site work uh, costs. Okay. Where you know feasibly, feasibly a franchisee could do a ground lease, put up a building, do the signage, the equipment, and then be open for far less. And all standalone. All standalone. Yep, with drive through. And how big square footage was the footprint look like? Just under 4,700 square feet. And what does, uh, what does training look like for a franchise owner? So training starts a week after you sign the franchise agreement. Every single week, we're, we're, um, we, we call it edu the education process. 
from educating site on site selection parameters to getting ready for lease negotiations slash purchase and sale agreements to what to expect during construction, et cetera. Then when you get into the operations uh, component, it's a six week training program. We require that the owner operator plus three managers attend the training. Mm -hmm. And uh, we feel that that is one of the most crucial um, uh, parts of being successful once you open thereafter. You might have a great opening, right? But openings are openings. We wanna maintain those sales, even grow those sales. And uh, that's what that six weeks is designed for. Mm. And marketing, you guys help uh, help them with the initial marketing? Yeah, yeah. So we help during the grand opening process. You know, marketing starts the day we sign the franchise agreement as well. Right. Let the market know we're coming. Uh, maybe do some food drops to the, uh, to the outlets, uh, to the news outlets and such. Um, so PR starts right away, right when the fence goes around the, uh, the, the land. <laughs> then we got Bona coming soon. QR code, sign up for our loyalty program, et cetera. And then once it gets a little closer, the building is, is looking good. Then we really start that grand opening push. And a lot of it's geared towards local advertising. Um, but the social, the social media campaign is uh, it's an evergreen campaign. It's mm -hmm. always going, coming soon. Here's the location. Here's our food. Getting some influencers involved once we could start to showcase the menu. So yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a comprehensive approach. Nice. Joe, uh, have you guys given thought in terms of a development plan? Like what's the vision for, for the, uh, for the company? Yeah. I mean, you know, we've set some goals, you know, we've, we've set to get to a hundred locations in five years. Um, but I can tell you that we are so focused on the first dozen franchisees that we've signed up, yeah, making them successful that that supersedes, you know, these big 50 store agreements that you hear some concepts doing. And we are just focused on making sure that what we're putting out there is exactly what the franchisee was looking for. So a lot of time goes into the operation support and business coaching. Yeah. I, and I would imagine that you're going to get a lot of multi-unit operators uh, knocking on your door with other food concepts saying they want to bring this and putting pressure on to wanting to you know, open multiple locations and it's going to be up to you yeah. guys to keep it a, a very manageable growth. Right. 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 I mean, you know, listen, you can hit lightning in a bottle and you get, you know, you're, you're successful in three major metro areas and somebody wants to take down a whole market. That's great. Right. We think the sweet spot to start is five locations, mm -hmm. but yes, we've gotten uh, approached from many hospitality groups that want to do a whole state um, a whole metro area, and we're having active discussions with those individuals now. Cool. You know, Joe, you, you guys have so much to be proud of, right? You've got this legacy brand and like this, uh, just a, a new breath of fresh air now uh, getting into franchising. What's, uh, what, what, what are you guys most proud of? There's got to be so many things that you guys are, are so happy with and so proud of to be part of. I'm most proud of the way our team is uh, embracing this new business model. So not only have we been able to offer growth to our existing team members through franchising positions, training positions, um, additional you know marketing, whatever it may be. And then we've also been able to onboard some great individuals with a lot of experience on the operations side mm -hmm. that are really helping us look at things differently for the, for the better of the company. And uh, so I would say definitely team focused. And, and then, you know, I, I'm, I'm most proud that we have something what, you know, people are looking to do in franchising is, uh, is great. You know, 38 units in, in less than two years, actually this fall will be two years. You know, we, we, uh, we as an organization need to be proud of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so when folks are, um, you know, looking to, to buy the franchise, uh, what are some of the things you want them to do specifically in the due diligence process that you think is like specific to Bona restaurants? Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing is, is really understanding what our program is through the FDD process, the franchise disclosure document mm -hmm. process, understanding what the marketing, what the relationship on marketing site selection, construction support, obviously marketing, you know, really understanding what's expected of each other. I think that's very important just to establish um, what, what the expectations from either side is, and then really feel passionate about where they want to grow their store. So you could pick Mesa, Arizona. Okay, why? Why do you like Mesa? Mm -hmm. All right, great. What kind of ties do you have there? 
do you uh, do you do you feel like this is going to be widely recognized? If if not, how are you going to introduce it to your market? Right. So you know, signing the contracts one thing. It's really what are they going to bring to the table once they get there that are going to make them successful, and then how do we coach them on the stuff they're not thinking about? Mm -hmm. So I think that you know, yeah, that's that's probably it. You know, when you're when you're coaching them. Uh, have you, have you found that it's been different, uh, in coaching franchise owners than coaching, you know, operators that are part of the company? Yes. A hundred percent for, for the good, not the bad though. Okay. Um, you know, when you're leading an organization, your name's on the building and you're building company stores, you kind of make all the decisions, right? right? Right. When it comes to franchising, you know, you need that entrepreneurial buy-in, right? There's a lot more explaining the whys around things, mm -hmm. which has actually helped how we're leading our corporate stores. Now we ask questions. We want buy-in. We want them to understand the whys so that together, you know, the worst thing in the world is when a company does a new product in the office and rolls it out to 30 locations. It's not a recipe for success. Right. You need that buy-in, that feedback. You want them to be, feel a part of the decision. And that's what franchise coaching, franchisee coaching has um, really showed me in the last 12 months. I'd say it's probably the number one biggest surprise that, that we have when we get into franchising is we, we were never expecting that our role is more business coaching um, than not. Yes, yes. And we've onboarded um, the director of franchise operations, name's John Westland. Mm -hmm. uh, he's worked for a number of concepts and he's been with us for three months, but I've learned so much from this individual on how to, how to speak franchisee, as he says. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great. I think that was a really critical transition for you guys because you, you got set in your ways for a long time, even though you guys are all about innovation, you got set in your ways and you knew exactly what you needed to do to run one of your restaurants. But once you get into franchising, you do need new voices of bringing outside people in with that experience to, to speak franchisee. So as you said. Yeah. And, and the biggest takeaways I have is at the local level, how well they can market their individual restaurants. Mm -hmm. and then, you know, from a, even a menu development standpoint, just some of the things when you're spending 50 hours a week in a store, they see more than what we're seeing as we're growing our company uh, in multiple facets. So we've gotten a lot of great feedback and uh, a lot of positive discussions thus far. Mm -hmm. Since you guys go three, gener uh, th uh, three generations back, Joe, can you pinpoint maybe anything in particular that's uh, maybe uh, a, a most memorable piece of advice that you got getting into the business? Yeah, definitely. My uncle Carlo, who's our chairman of the board, he always says, don't be the smartest one in the room. You know, just because I have 15 years experience in the business, doesn't mean I'm the smartest one in the room all the time. So personally, I think about that a lot when I'm in meetings, when I'm on franchise calls, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a, there's a way to conduct yourself and there's a way to accept feedback and there's a way to make a discussion as a, as a group rather than just here are the orders. Right. So I think that that's pretty, pretty crucial. And, and the other thing is we're always stronger together. Yes. Um, you have to build a great team for this to be successful long-term. Yes. For a couple years, it could be a one or two man band mm -hmm. and you're, you're, uh, you're opening up locations, you're, you're doing well, but really that well-rounded team that gives different perspectives, uh, a forum for idea exchange. Yeah. That's definitely another big one. That's great advice. That is, that is, that was great advice for sure. Have you guys stepped back for a moment yet and reflected on how amazing this has been this whole run. I mean, your, your, your grandfather, when he comes to a discovery day, can, can does he even imagine that this is what it's turned into? He would say he's very proud of us. Oh my gosh. As he, does, as he does very regularly. That's sweet. But I, I would say, no, we haven't stepped back. Um, we're really focused on what we're trying to achieve. And there isn't this level of comfort here that, uh, you know, everything's working and, you know, right. let's just keep rolling. No, there's a lot of, there's a lot of daily conversation on how we need to get better um, to, to keep being elite in the space we're in. 
Uh, I think that's great. And I, I hope you guys do take a moment though to reflect on how, what an incredible job you've done. In other words, I really want you guys to make sure you're enjoying the journey at the same time because you guys are, have done something absolutely magnificent and something that's you know so unique. I mean, four decades, three generations, you guys created a legacy brand. Everybody knows it in Illinois. And just to, to see what you've done um, and what you're doing, I, I want you guys to still enjoy this journey because it is a magnificent journey. We may have had a nice dinner or two. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fine. Uh, Joe, this, this has been wonderful. Um, if someone was interested in learning more about the brand, where can they go to uh, either one of the concepts if they wanted to get more information on the franchise? Yeah, so you can go to abona.com and then there's a franchise bar that you hit and then you get over to our franchising page or you could go to www.bonafranchise.com and then uh, either myself or my brother will be your first point of contact. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go through the education process together and help you make a good decision. Nice. Very nice. All right, Joe, look, I always finish every podcast with the tip jar because the franchise community is so generous with giving advice. So if, what would advice would you give me if I was an entrepreneur that wanted to franchise my concept? Definitely think about what it's going to take you to get out of the mindset from I do this for myself versus I do this with others. And a company like I franchise could really help with the franchise specific items you need to have uh, buttoned up as you release this in the wild. And then a strong level of support via corporate departments like training, marketing, and, and site selection and, and architectural. Those are pretty crucial. So I would say just to back up, you know, partner with people that have been through your journey, mm -hmm. the journey you want to go on, put a lot of emphasis on where you're going to grow and how you're going to do it. And then have a plan as you enter those new markets. Joe, that's great advice. And I will remember the term before you release it to the wild. That is, <laughs> that is very true. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. I mean, it's what we did and we're working. <laughs> yep, you are. Well, Joe, thanks so much. It was nice meeting you. I am going to check out Bona Restaurants in Sarasota for sure. I will have to try it out. Thank you for having me. Much appreciated. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate being on the show. Take care. Thank you for tuning into the Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast. For additional insights, guest applications, and to stay connected, visit us at efbpodcast.com. The Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast is for entertainment purposes only, and the views expressed do not necessarily represent those of Emerging Franchise Brands, its host Frank Fumi, or Emerging Franchise Group, LLC. Any discussed franchise or investment opportunity requires thorough investigation, obtaining proper disclosure documents, and expert consultation before making any investment decisions. The podcast and its host do not offer professional advice or endorsements, and they hold no responsibility for actions, representations, accuracy, or consequential damages related to the podcast content.